part of the land. When I climb into a tree, I hold a flower in my hand. One with the earth, I'm one with the land. We hold the future of our earth. One of the things that most struck me uh, in what Bruno Latour was saying, uh, which I'm desperately trying to tweet, but I'm not very good at tweeting, um, is this idea that the current negotiation framework is utopian because it does not represent entities that have real power and that the attempt to include such entities, including specifically multinational corporations, is actually more realistic. And this is a powerful claim and one that I think has resonance uh, both practical, legal, and political, theoretical. And I'd be very interested for, for more comments on that. Um, when he says um, current negotiations are utopian, I think what he means uh, uh, in, in concrete way is that when we see as a public or a citizen the way negotiations are happening, we only see states negotiating. Um, and, and in order not to be lost in all, all this, 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 this uh, negotiations on climate change, what Winnerato wants is that you actually define your territory and find your uh, level of action at the level of your ter uh, territory. So that means that this booth over there of cities and region, uh, they have a huge possibility to, to act and they are acting. There was a, a summit of, of mayors uh, last week um, and, and, and they should be represented. Um, so it doesn't mean concretely we didn't, we didn't talk about how to implement that or how to put this in negotiations. But I don't think that was the point. The point was more to say, in our simulation, we represent all the territories that are acting, um, uh, whether according to the scale, local or global, or according to the uh, links between actors that are not states, and that all have a possibility to act, and that are all concerned with climate change. So, so this is, to me, why he says our simulation was more real, because it showed more all the different influences, all the different concerns, and all the different kind of actors that actually do something on climate change. This is another thing that I always have in mind. There is not an answer, I guess, but I want to share it in debate so you can maybe debate you too. And if it's not dangerous for democracy to have these representations directly and not being through the governments, because if you have a country like Argentina and you put a very huge important um, business company with the same power, with the same vote, in the same debate, this is not dangerous because usually in a debate, like in a real way, you need to go through the government, through a legal democracy process to have the voice, or maybe not. But instead, like uh, officially, this is the legal way to do it. And if you go too much power to order directly be represented, this is not dangerous for this to make it strong, the democracy inside the countries. Do you understand my point? This is a debate I think we all should have about giving this importance of power to this. We were really rethinking uh, the notion of sovereignty. And, and so you had all those states in the simulation, and what they were saying uh, when there was a discussion on these new kind of governance systems, it's like, yeah, but our sovereignty is being challenged or is being threatened. And then you had all those non-state actors, entities, saying, yes, but if we want to have a voice, there is a need to have new systems of governance that go beyond the national sovereignty system. And, 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 and there is no answer that can satisfy everyone. And basically, we agreed on the fact, on the vision, but not on the frameworks. Uh, the fact that ecosystem should be governed, but uh, I think that a big problem is how ecosystem is defined. I mean, there is a precise definition, but like, what scale of ecosystem? Because the earth is an ecosystem. Everybody's body is an ecosystem as well. So th this, this is a very tricky point. And yeah, so, and as an um, endangered species uh, delegation, uh, it was really challenging to say, yeah, we respect the fact uh, that uh, I mean, states are sovereign, and also there is a need not to separate um, negotiations and decisions from the ones that are going to make efforts, I mean, conscious efforts, meaning states. So there were like this duality, once again, uh, between we negotiate and we, we want action to be, to be taken, uh, and so we want the decision to be made by the ones that are going to take actions. But at the same time, we want to be represented in the negotiations. So 
this was really tricky and I don't have the answer for, for this question, but uh, I agree that we don't talk about it enough. This community, the Bishnoi, is a community I discovered in 2000, actually somebody told me about it in 2006. And um, it's a community, the man who told me about it, told me uh, it's a community that lives in harmony and wildlife since the 15th century. So I thought, okay, so it's maybe a kind of a small group in the Tardas, and so they live in Rajasthan, in India, in the, so it's the western part of India. And uh, I thought it's maybe a small group of people, maybe some thousands of people. And uh, when I reached there, when I managed to go there, I found out that there are six to seven hundred thousand people. So actually, this community is living in complete harmony with wildlife and nature. The first thing is to share, so share with wildlife, trees, animals, and so he created the ecotax, which is amazing, in the 15th century. So they have to share 10% of the income or grains with wildlife. That's amazing. We're not able to do it. They did it in the 15th century. You can find the 29 rules easily, you know, on internet, on my website, on but um, the idea is not to, you know, transpose and do exactly with the 29 rules. Some are not, you know, in, in Europe, you won't pray the prophet, for example, the guru or, you know, the Hindu. But you can, like, planting trees, this is some, something everybody can do. In Europe, you don't need that many trees because you're not in a desert. But um, it depends on the country. You just have to adapt and just be inspired with what they do and try to find new ways to, to do it yourself here. This is just the idea. It's just to inspire people by what they do since 500 years. I, you can be inspired by some rules, and uh, that's it. But, but if you want to become a Bishnoi, you can. You just follow the 29 rules, that's it. But it's not easy all the time, let's see. <laughs> I think that the response to that questions, th that question was already made by Kira Vinke when she uh, said that the poor are those who are suffering climate change the most. 18 million people are dying from poverty related causes each year. How many of these deaths are really unavoidable? It turns out almost all of them are avoidable and so the, di the synchronic comparison would make us look really, really bad. 95% of premature deaths from poverty are entirely avoidable because they're powerful systemic factors working against the poor. So the top 1% own more than half of all wealth. The top 66 people own as much wealth as the bottom half of humankind taken together, 3.2, sorry, 3.7 billion people. So enormous inequality, and that inequality is accumulating through systemic factors, through the way we organize our economy, our world financial system. And that produces an enormous headwind against the poor, or to use a different metaphor, it's as if the poor were put on an elevator or an escalator that is going downwards. And so they have to run and run, and we all who are supporting the poor have to run and run just to make sure that the poor stay in place that they don't fall further behind. We could achieve much more in terms of poverty eradication by turning off that escalator, by stopping the headwind or reducing the headwind than we can ever do by ten thousands of us going into the developing world and trying to help poor people overcome that huge centrifugal force that is built into the existing financial and economic system of our world. Why are the majority of the poor women? And why are it specifically women from ethnic minorities? And we know, of course, the answer. It is about discrimination. It is about an unfair starting point. We know that from 
all the assets earned in the world, only most of them, 50% of them are owned by only 1% of the people, but of these 1% of the people, the majority are men. In a world where climate change... How long has it been like this? ...only affects people far away. The anthropologist What we do is we follow Susie, an anthropologist around the world. She's studying climate change. We follow her to Siberia, to Kiribati in the South Pacific, um, to Peru where there's melting glaciers. And the whole movie is done from the perspective of her teenage daughter. And I know how serious this issue of climate change is. And I know that if we only approach educating people about climate change by giving them science, we're not going to get anywhere. We can see that. We've been doing that for a while now. We need to put a human face on climate change. We need to bring people to the places where our brothers and sisters are being challenged today by climate change. We need to go to the high latitude areas of the world where ice is disappearing rapidly, whether it's permafrost or glacial ice. We need to go to the near sea level areas where people are living and are being challenged by sea level rise and they are going underwater. And we need to bring that into a, uh, an effective documentary film to reach people. Uh, climate change, as we know, we've approached it from a natural science perspective. We look at graphs and charts, numbers, etc. How do we put a human face on it? It's social science. And I do say in the film, I don't think we can change the world. I think we change and that that changes the world. The how we change the world is not about going out and fixing everything outside of us. It's about uh, understanding the power that we have, right? Which is to change ourselves and to take every advantage that we can. You know, we all have to understand that judges are also human beings, although some of them think they are not. We are all human beings, and it means that most, still, most of the senior judges have not had proper environmental law educations in law schools. So the task that we have is, one, to convince our legal systems in different countries that judges are important in not just protecting the environment but in the climate change. So we are here to listen to the message of uh, the winners of the Global Change and Youth Music Contest. We have the slogan, let the music talk, let the rhythm play, let the world know what the youth have to say. The prize winner of the votes of the public. So Adeline, would you like to stand up? So I congratulate you. This is your award, and go on like this. Uh, first and foremost, I want to thank uh, UNESCO, of course, and also Flowchair for this amazing award. Um, just a brief description of what this video and music means for us. It's a representation of the thousands of youth from Indonesia who have collaborated into one as an NGO group called Sabat Alam, or Friends of the Nature, where we believe that in order to be able to give a direct, strong message without any alteration is through music as it can reach more people and especially those negotiators here in the field of COP21 in Paris. And it's just a representation of our hopes in our own language. Um, So this is the award and this is the winner. I give it to you and congratulate you. So I'm very proud that we got this uh, young not politicians making politics with music. Anyway, there's no real difference. Everything you're doing with your heart, every word that reaches the heart is trying to change the world. And we all both are doing this not because of the money, just because we try to change the world. I congratulate you.
We slow right in some forest, master forestation. Thank you all. It was such an honor to perform for you guys.